This installment of The Crucible examines the behavioral differences between physicians who've been sued and those who've not been sued. And the paper comes from the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1997, and it's titled Physician-Patient Communication, the Relationship with Malpractice Claims Among Primary Care Physicians and Surgeons. The authors evaluated audio recordings of 10 routine office visits for 59 primary care physicians and 65 surgeons. The recordings were scored on 25 different communication parameters. The authors found no differences between the communication skills of surgeons who'd been sued as compared to surgeons who'd not been sued. Among primary care physicians, those who'd not been sued were more likely to tell the patient what to expect, more likely to solicit the patient's opinion, laughed more often, and spent an average of three minutes longer per patient encounter. The authors concluded, and I quote, routine physician-patient communication differs in primary care physicians with versus without prior malpractice claims. This paper was published right as the communication era of risk management was taking shape. And it's been heavily relied upon to support the notion that certain doctors are predisposed to being sued because they're poor communicators. And although that's a widely held belief, I think we should take a closer look at this data upon which it's based. And the first problem is that the study had a total of 124 physicians, which is a very small sample. The authors found no differences among the 65 surgeons. So it looks like something else is causing them to be sued, which doesn't make sense, but it leaves us with an even smaller sample of 59 PCPs. The second problem is that the study was done after the physicians had been sued, which is concerning because litigation can have a devastating effect on physicians. So the lack of openness that the authors identified among the physicians who'd been sued might be the result of litigation, not the cause. The third problem is that when you compare 25 different variables, the laws of probability dictate that you're probably going to find a few differences. And although the differences here relate to communication, communication was the only thing the author studied. If they'd studied something else, they might have found differences there as well. The fourth problem with this study is that it doesn't establish causation. The mere fact that some differences were found doesn't mean that those differences are the reason these doctors got sued. It certainly doesn't mean that those differences are the reason the rest of us get sued. And we therefore shouldn't assume that addressing these differences will prevent us from being sued even though that's exactly what we've done. But as problematic as that is, the methodology here is even more flawed. And the flaw is a built-in assumption that the patient decides which doctor to sue. This study is based on an assumption that the patient sits at home and decides which doctor to sue. He then comes into the lawyer's office, tells the lawyer what to do, and the lawyer does exactly what the patient says, even though the lawyer's working on contingency and won't get paid if he loses. The fatal flaw in this methodology is an assumption that lawyers play no role in the legal process other than to carry out the patient's exact directive. But that's not how it works. According to the rules of professional responsibility, which govern the practice of law, the client determines the goals of representation, but the lawyer determines the methods. The client decides whether he wants to sue, and the lawyer decides the best way to do it, which is why most lawsuits involve multiple defendants, three or four physicians, the physician's employers, the pharmacist, and the hospital. The patient didn't decide to sue all those people. He doesn't even understand why some of them are being sued. The attorney came up with that list to cover the bases and maximize the possibility of success. What we need to understand is that defendants are chosen based on the strategic judgment of the attorney, not the interpersonal experiences of the patient. The decision is based on strategy, not feelings. If you've ever been sued, it's because the attorney chose you as a defendant. And there might be any number of reasons he did that, 
but I can tell you it has nothing to do with how often you smile or laugh or ask the patient's opinion. And that's why this study, along with every other study that uses this methodology, is of no value. If we want to understand how the legal system works, we have to accept that attorneys play a significant role in the process. And we have to account for that role in any study that we do, lest we continue to be led astray by flawed methodology and meaningless results. Thanks for listening.